maybe jump in. I don't see the um, our representative from DHS quite yet, but we can jump into this and um, have Mark uh, kick us off in just a minute. Um, so I just wanted to introduce myself to everybody first. I know that most of you I've uh, at least been on some email chains with, but of course haven't met most, most anybody in person in the last year. Um, but I just started at OCI about two months ago and I'm gonna be OCI's point person on this partnership. And as soon as I started, um, our team at OCI really highlighted how important this partnership was to us and how committed our team was to continuing to do this work, um, particularly um, our public affairs team, like Kelsey and Derek, I know many of you know quite well. Um, and looking ahead, we are continuing to make it a top priority and Mark's gonna talk about um, some of the ways OCI is helping support support this partnership and encourage people to get covered and use their health coverage appropriately um, and really navigate the difficult year we have coming up um, and, and different ways that we're going to be able to approach the, um, the, the difficulties that will be ahead of us with the pandemic and um, possible special enrollment periods and the upcoming open enrollment, of course, at the end of the year. Um, in addition to those discussions at the end of the meeting, we're also going to have a conversation about some process improvement ideas we have moving forward um, and some of the ways we can start implementing those and get folks feedback to make sure that we are resetting and making sure that our the work of this partnership is able to meet um, meet the goals that have been laid out before us and that we are doing that efficiently and effectively for everybody. So. Um, with that brief intro, I'm going to hand it over to um, Commissioner Fable, who's with us, and Mark's going to give us some um, updates from OCI just for a few minutes, and then we will go to some quick updates from DHS. So I'll hand it to Mark. Great. Thank you, Sarah. And uh, I, I just want to tell everybody how excited we are to have Sarah joining our team, and, and she's brought a lot of uh, energy and enthusiasm and and is excited to uh, be part of this initiative that we've been working on. And uh, just want to thank everybody for taking time to be with us today. I, uh, it's great to see people, even if it is on a Zoom call, uh, but it, it's great to see everyone. And just want to really thank you for all your efforts to help people get the health coverage that they need. And uh, we're truly, um, thankful for all the work you've done and what you're going to be doing in the upcoming year. And I think it's pretty safe to say that all of us are, are glad to see uh, uh, 2020 behind us. Um, uh, I know from an OCI perspective that we had several initiatives that we wanted to work on in this area and we just weren't really able to get to it because uh, like everyone else, uh, uh, we had to shift our priorities uh, to dealing with the pandemic. and and you know, last year was not the year that we planned for, but I, I will say that I was very proud of how uh, the OCI team pivoted to meet a lot of the new challenges. And I know you know about a lot of our challenges, but you know, just for instance, last spring, you know, our team had to really work quickly to provide information and clarity to both consumers and insurers on, on a lot of new issues that came up that we've never saw before uh, that were brought up by the, the COVID crisis and, and, you know, I think as you all know, we look at ourselves as Wisconsin's insurance watchdog and, and, you know, we knew we immediately had to get a lot of bulletins out to remind insurers of their obligations uh, to cover COVID and the related costs. And, and, and we also had to weigh in on a lot of coverage disputes. And, uh, and, and one of the key things that we had to work on was our communications to uh, consumers. The communication to consumers was really vital. And, and to reach consumers, we, we issued a new, numerous uh, press releases to make sure that every Wisconsinite knew that the COVID testing and the treatment uh, was covered. And, and now we're doing the exact same thing for the vaccine. Um, so I think, if anything, this pandemic has really made it clear that the original goal of, of this partnership to expand healthcare coverage is, is now more important than ever. And as our communities face this virus, uh, they also incre uh, face increased uh, unemployment and economic uncertainty. And I just want everyone to know on this call that OCI is committed to the work of this partnership. 
Uh, we know that this group can make a difference and is making a difference. Uh, this partnership has really allowed us to co collaborate with you to encourage Wisconsinites to take part in open enrollment and have access to affordable, high quality insurance. And uh, you know, just some of the things, I, I do wanna highlight some of the things that OCI has done in this space. And I, I know a lot of you already know this, but I really uh, just wanna take this opportunity to thank uh, Kelsey and Derek from the OCI team. Uh, they've really worked hard on a lot of different uh, aspects of, of this uh, partnership. Uh, they created a digital toolbox. Uh, they updated the WIS covered uh, uh, website and i think many of you have seen how how that website works now and it's it's a great improvement and shared frequent uh social media posts and and really have done a, a good job of tracking the progress that we've made uh trying to deliver our message to all corners uh, of, of the state and and really to a lot of monitors served um, communities and, and uh, counties. Um, and, and you know, a lot of this, you know, I just really want to thank them for the work and the, uh, and the work that you've done because hundreds of thousands of Wisconsinites uh, have enrolled in health coverage uh, this past fall. And we know that this pandemic will continue through 2021. So our, our work to expand health care coverage uh, to continue to adapt and, and to continue to adapt is really going to be critical here and 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 that's why i'm really proud to announce our that our agency has applied for a federal grant to support states in strengthening the private uh health insurance marketplace and and as part of that application we highlighted the great work that this partnership has done um, We've also asked for this funding to support some aspects of this partnership, including marketing and outreach uh, to best support consumers, uh, as I said before, in, in a lot of those underserved uh, uh, counties. So in closing, I, I'll just say that OCI is really proud to be uh, to be part of this work and, and we really look forward to uh, working with you and navigating the challenges that we're going to be facing in 2021. Uh, so with that, I will turn it back over to you, Sarah. Great. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, and then I am going to hand it back on to um, Elise at DHS. Uh, she's going to give us a quick update from their perspective. So not sure if I can find her in my list. Perfect. There you are. Hi, Sarah. I'm here. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. And um, what, what inspiring remarks. Thank you. That's it's a hard, uh, hard thing to follow up on, but um, exactly, I was asked to give kind of a high level overview of where we are with vaccine rollout. Um, so first of all, my name is Elise Balser. I'm a CDC public health advisor. I typically work in the Wisconsin immunization program, but uh, with the response, I'm now leading the communication uh, efforts and outreach to the public uh, around vaccination. So I was asked to share, um, uh, just an update on some of our efforts uh, around outreach. Um, and I'd, I'd love to hear from this group if you have any ideas around you know, ways we can support each other. So um, to start off with, I'd like to just point out that um, we have a train the trainer model um, for a, communi a vaccine communication framework that we put together. Um, and just from a high level overview, you know, some of the content that's included in that framework uh, are the following. So the image that you can protect yourself and your family from this virus by getting the vaccine. The vaccine is 95% effective. That's, that's a good vaccine. Um, second message, you know, it, with our current vaccine products on the market, you need two doses to get that full, um, full protection from the vaccine. The third message is, you know, ways to keep your vaccine safe when you'll probably uh, excuse me, vaccine record safe, um, ways you can store it, um, times you'll probably need to take it out to show that you had vaccine on um, the vaccine. Um, message number four, uh, the COVID-19 vaccine is free or at no cost to you. Um, and then message number five around uh, COVID-19 vaccine safety. And really that's broken down into three additional messages, which is um, there was careful research done around the vaccines. 
um, the vaccines have to meet the high bar of um, meeting uh, the safety and efficacy standards for an emergency use authorization through the Food and Drug Administration. And the third uh, vaccine safety message is that um, even after uh, authorization, we continue to monitor for safety and efficacy um, through very well-established vaccine safety monitoring systems that have been around for decades. So all of those are kind of key messaging that we have in the framework. Um, and so as I stated, we do have a train the trainer model. I'd love to think of ways with you all that we could um, you know, get this messaging out um, through the, the networks that you have. Um, before I open it up to questions, though, um, I just want to share just from a very high level uh, uh, planning that we um, were encouraging people to think about where they can get the vaccine. Um, you know, we we're asking them to think about where do you get your annual flu shot typically, your annual flu vaccine? Do you go to your healthcare provider? Do you go to your pharmacist? Do you go to your local health department? Um, and as a vaccine uh, becomes more available and more people are eligible to receive it, you know, that's really how we're asking people to, um, to think about it just to start. Um, and then in addition to our, our kind of typical influenza vaccine structure, DHS is working um, to add additional uh, points of, of uh, getting vaccinated. So thinking about mobile vaccination teams and community vaccine sites that we that are similar to our vaccination uh, testing sites. So with that, I, if I have just a moment, Sarah, I'd like to just ask if anybody has any suggestions on how we can partner and help get this information out. As, uh, as the commissioner was talking, I wrote down you know, the toolbox. It sounds like you have a website and some social media presence. So let, let's pause and just, I'd love some feedback. Um, this is Adam at Spanker in covering Wisconsin. Uh, just a short first, you know, knee-jerk thought I had was I would like you to come to the outreach and education work group. Um, you know, I've done a ton of train the trainer, and our group has a lot of experience in that regard. And we we often talk about communication and how things are being messaged. And this is one where you really want to get that right. Like the the messages that you presented, for example, I would switch the order up on a number of those. I know that's probably that's not how it has to be, but agencies would need to know that okay, this is the one that's going to work the best. For example. And then obviously um, associating those with the different uh, challenges and barriers for a given population, um, and which is also part of what my work group does. Yeah, I'd love to come and talk and I'd love to hear about how we can incorporate some of the messaging that you've, uh, some of the lessons learned that you've uh, experienced. Absolutely. Um, I guess, uh, Sarah, is there a way for me to get connected to these groups? Yeah, absolutely. I'm writing that down right now. I can follow up with you um, to connect you with at least the outreach group um, for now and, and see where else we can go from there. Um, I think once we do the work group report outs too, we might have some other groups that would be interested in plugging in a little bit more with the vaccine Great. Uh, distribution. Great, thank you. All right. Are there any other questions for Elise while we have her? Yeah, Elise, if I can share on Saturday. Erin, hi. I, how are Good you doing? You. I'm fine. Yeah. How are you? Uh, we're doing well. Yeah, so uh, we, we had a very successful event this past Saturday. Um, we it's called our annual We're Off to a Good Start event. And the goal of that event is to help Black men who set New Year's resolutions, we kind of encourage them and empower them to keep them throughout the year. But this year was a little different. We had put in a little bit of discussion about getting vaccinated. Um, so we actually brought in um, actor, comedian, and political commentator D.L. Hewley. Uh, some may know who he is, but it turned out to be a very good event. We had 135 participants register from 25 different states. <clears throat> we had two, um, one correctional facility that let 20, 20 of their inmates view the event. And then we had a detention facility that let 30 kids um, view the event, but it was so powerful. It was so nice. And I want to make sure that we don't miss those opportunities because I did share it with them. The only person that took us up on partnering was the American Heart Association. And so these are events that when we put them out, not to just overlook them because we, we really are pulling in some really good numbers um, across the nation. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Uh -huh. 
Thank you. And what an exciting event. It sounds great. It was fun. Good. And then Elise, um, this is Stephanie Sievers from Covering Wisconsin. Um, I, we have some other ideas potentially um, of ways that we could help get the word out. So maybe offline we could connect some more and, and talk about some different ways to promote some of your messaging and, and whatnot. So that would be great. Thank you, Stephanie. Appreciate it. All right. Great. Well, we really appreciate you coming, Elise. I know mm -hmm. that uh, everyone at DHS is very busy, so I'm glad that you um, were able to share some of those uh, those you know messaging ideas with us. And I'm sure this group will be happy to continue to work with you on that. Obviously, the vaccine is a big part of getting people healthcare this year. So, absolutely. Great. Um, if it's okay, it, it, I'd like to hang out for a few minutes to hear the rest of the meeting. If that's okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Great. Great. All right, uh, then we are going to jump into the work group report. Sarah, this so, is Jones from oh. Medicaid. Um, did yes. you want an update on Medicaid and Badger Care where we are, or do you just want to move on to the work groups? I just wondered. Um, I think we could take a couple minutes um, if you want to give a really quick update. Yeah, just a quick update. Um, Anna Benton would normally be here, um, but she is now the uh, actually the lead for the DHS vaccination team. Um, so we've given her up from DMS um, and asked her in, and, and she was asked to work with people like, you know, like Elise and other people. Um, and they're very lucky to have her. From a Medicaid standpoint and a Badger Care standpoint, just so everybody's aware of it, um, we've seen an increase of about 200,000 people overall in the program since the beginning of the year, directly related to the pandemic. Um, if you're not aware of it, you should be. Um, no one can actually leave Medicaid or be terminated from Medicaid unless they voluntarily request or they leave the state. Uh, uh, and the other one is, is death, um, which we doesn't, hope it doesn't occur. Um, we have seen that growth in many ways because of continuous eligibility, but we are seeing a big spike the last three weeks in applications. We normally get about 5,000 applications a week. We're up uh, above uh, 10,500 now for a couple of weeks in a row. So I think the economy is starting to uh, turn, you know, really uh, change people's economic outlook and they're starting to apply for the program. So just be aware, we're seeing a, a pretty large spike. Um, when the pandemic hit, there were a lot of changes that were made to Medicaid. I mentioned the continuous eligibility, but also we pushed all renewals out um, and we will be doing so until the public health emergency is over. Um, there was a letter to the governors um, from the Biden administration that pushed the public health, health emergency to the end of 2021. We are not quite sure if that means September 30th or December 30th first, uh, depending on whether you're a Fed fiscal year or you're, you think like normal people. Um, so that's going on. Um, Medicaid's been managing the state's response to COVID. Of course, we cover all the tests. We cover rides to and from testing, um, and we will be providing them and do provide them for vaccinations as well. Uh, there's no, of course, there's no copay for either one. Medicaid is paying the Medicare rate, which is the most we can pay um, for uh, vaccination administration. So even though people don't have to pay for it, we are paying uh, the people who are doing the vaccination for those. Um, and lastly, I just want everybody to be aware of a couple of things that are going to happen soon. Um, to, uh, actually, what's today? The 25th, six days from now we will be rolling out a residential substance use disorder benefit um, that will be statewide uh, effective February 1st. We've been waiting a long time to do that, but I thought that this is a group that would appreciate hearing about that. It means that our Medicaid members can now get care for their substance use disorder um, in a residential facility. Um, and we've now got a whole lot of uh, facilities signed up. So I will turn it back over to you, Sarah. Just wanted to get a quick little plug in for Medicaid. No, absolutely. I appreciate that. Um, so then I will hand it over to our work groups for their report outs. Um, so if we want to start with, I don't know uh, which person is going to be leading this necessarily, but if somebody from workforce and capacity wants to give a quick report out on their work group. Sure. I'll hand it yes, over to I can do that. I'm Bobby Peterson with ABC for Health uh, and I chair the uh, Direct Assistance and Workforce Capacity Committee. Um, we've been meeting for um, um, 
many months now going through uh, quite a bit of information. Part of our process was developing a resources matrix, which I can share with you, Sarah, uh, and maybe Elise and others, because it's a, it's a really important document that really inventories a lot of the consumer assistance programs that exist in Wisconsin across the spectrum for, for you know, specifically for aged and disabled, for veterans and for other resources. So we've created a resources matrix and looking at how do we fill some of the holes that exist out there. Um, we also looked at some of the training uh, and the tr that those programs receive and, and also thinking about how do we build capacity and how do we develop a training program to support a workforce really directed at uh, sort of the consumer assistance issues that, that we've talked about as a part of our work group. Through the course of our meetings, we have um, invited speakers from the ADRC, from the veterans groups, um, from family groups, and the members have had a chance to hear a lot about what uh, exists out there. And we've framed up some recommendations. Um, the most specific one I think is um, we're looking at uh, identifying ways to support a virtual fully staffed year round consumer assistance hub. Um, we felt as though we need to have year round support. Obviously there's points of emphasis during open enrollment, uh, but there's also other times of the year um, like a pandemic <laughs> or uh, um, seasonal employment or back to school, things like that that are all that, that should be opportunities for us to focus on some of the, the specific consumer needs, but we know that there are things that happen all year round. We also know that, and this is a nice to hear from Jim, that the uh, public health emergency is likely to be expend, extended through the year, because that's really a, a key element in making sure that people maintain continuity. When that ends, we know there's going to be a little bit of a train wreck because we have to figure out where do all those people go. We're, we'll talk about that in more detail later. But I think looking at uh, a consumer assistance hub that we need to have a designated helpline uh, intake process. We need to look at ways of providing assistance, not at the, uh, the same level, but some sort of triage that helps people at a basic intake and outreach level, maybe a, uh, an assister level, and then a more advanced navigator complex case review because everyone's going to have different issues and we have to be able to issue spot through that type of a triage and get people to the right help that they need. We also need to make sure we triage people to existing assistance that exists. So if it's someone with a disability, getting them to the ADRC or it's a senior over age 60 or a veteran, we know that there are resources that are specific for those populations and we need to address those. We don't need to reinvent the wheel and that was a big part of our resources inventory. We also need to make sure that we have a system in place that helps to promote equity by providing some at-risk consumers with ongoing coverage management, benefits checkups. We know from, and this a lot of this came out of the, um, the churn report that was done out of Milwaukee. If you haven't read it, Dick DeMeo put it together, but it really outlines a lot of the needs that people have for ongoing levels of assistance. So if you're, if you're a low income person dealing with fluctuating income, fluctuating jobs, stressful environments, providing some opportunity for better engagement and assistance and management during the period of that benefits with benefits checkups uh, and interventions to keep people covered. So that's a big part of it. So that's all a part of our consumer assistance hub. We, we think it could be accessed potentially through the, um, uh, the new website, the was covered website, uh, but then identifying some specific assistance that's available because a website can do only so much and we need actual human beings to help navigate through the, comp the complexities of the system. The second recommendation is for training. We know that all the people that are behind this and providing this support need training and assistance. And it's not sort of a one and done deal, but it's initial assessment of competency. It's training and remotely delivered training. And the state has a lot of experience, especially on the Medicaid side in remote training that they do for through their AERC networks. And there's a lot of things that we can learn from that to build a consumer assistance hub and a workforce that responds to the needs that we have out there right now. Uh, we, need, we can do it through online learning management support, um, video on demand and at the different levels again, so that it is basic intermediate and advanced. 
but it's not a one and done deal. It's continuing education. So there's refreshers every year and updates. And these are things that we're doing already through covering Wisconsin, um, Health Watch Wisconsin, but we need to formalize it more for this network. Um, so, and it's also a way for us to gather important policy feedback and to make sure that we're you know, assuring competency of the workforce, but we're also improving the, prompt, the, the process of, um, through the ongoing trainings and, and getting better at how we do it. Um, and training, finally, training must also include the substantive programs, public programs, private programs, the interface between them, but also important skill-based training, um, understanding um, cultural competence and relevance, dealing with the challenging situations, uh, mental health situations, dealing with uh, a lot of distinct groups uh, in the state and understanding the nuances of access to healthcare and coverage in Wisconsin. Um, our work group is meeting again on February 2nd at 2 p.m. If people are interested in um, getting involved in our work group, please contact me. It's bobbyp at safetyweb.org or you can call me at 608-444-7197. But we're really interested in feedback from the agencies and the council on our recommendations. Great, thank you, Bobby. Um, well, so I'm gonna jump through the rest of the work rep reports and then we have questions at the end. So we can kind of have general questions and discussion of all the work group report outs. Um, at the end of this section. So um, thank you for that, Bobby. And I'll jump to data next. So whoever's presenting from the data work group. Sure, this is Melissa Duffy reporting to you from my basement. Um, and I'm gonna try and cover three things in about five minutes. So I apologize in advance for talking really fast. Um, I wanna update everybody on the data dashboard concept that we've been working on, which um, and I know that I've talked about in previous meetings. I want to tell you about two other initiatives, and then I'm going to inform you all about a need that is rising to the top of our priority list. Um, so on the da data dashboard, I hope everyone is familiar with our concept of creating a platform where outreach workers can more easily access and understand data that is available but not easily found by the average layperson. I'm talking about things like census data, for example. Um, over the past couple months, we've been working to refine two visualizations that we plan to build our launch around. Um, and uh, these visualizations um, would help us better understand what's going on in a, like on a county basis. So we can use that information to focus our resources and divine, design interventions that lead to higher coverage rates. Um, we're really focused on two things. The first is thinking about highlights and context that we might be able to realistically add to these tools to enhance their power. The second is working with OCI and how we bring this all to fruition and make it sustainable. Um, as you can imagine, this is gonna require some resources from the state, but hopefully a big pay payoff. Um, and you heard the commissioner earlier talk about OCI's grant application and this dashboard would be a small part of that effort. So looking ahead, we're excited to work with OCI on bringing everything together and, and launching that. Um, the two other things I want to preview that we're working on, the first is a data inventory roadmap that once completed may be able to help all of us locate reliable data that's already out there that can inform all of our work. Um, this comes along with a gap analysis that identifies missing data. And then we also have a sub work group led by Allison and Donna uh, Friedsam that um, they're working on developing KPIs that'll help us measure progress our state is making in promoting and achieving coverage in Wisconsin. So we're at the point right now where we have an early draft of these and um, I'm sure we'll be sharing those in the near future. Um, and then finally, the, the a big part of our charter is identifying data needs that support the other work groups. And all the work groups really have expressed a strong interest in having data to better understand where we should focus our resources mm. as we begin to transition away from the public health emergency. So that is something that I will be um, reaching out to DHS in particular to see what we can do there. Um, in closing, like Bobby said, um, you know, feel free to reach out to me if you want to get involved in the data work group. 
Um, my email is mduffy at dcstrategies.org. And you can call me at 608-334-0624. Thank you. Great, thank you, Melissa. That was very uh, efficient. You got that all done very quickly. <laughs> um, all right, then we will go to outreach. So whoever wants to present from the outreach work group on what they've been working on. Yep, that's me, Adam from Covering Wisconsin again. Uh, so I think for all of our objectives and things we accomplished in 2020, that's been reported on pretty well at this point. So I'm gonna be looking ahead. Our work group is more or less returning to its roots, its charter that we developed um, in the middle of last year about identifying vulnerable populations and making sure that they have um, the, right, the information they need in the way they need it about uh, Badger Care Health, or Badger Care Plus, uh, other health, health benefits, public benefits, and um, in the marketplace, of course. And that is, it's interesting because during last year, we, we had a lofty objectives, obviously, and the public health crisis kind of sidelined everything we had intended to accomplish. And yes, we focused on that and got a lot done, but we're really interested in returning to what we had said we wanted to do and our objectives for this year um, reflect that quite a lot. We have, we're going to be identifying vulnerable populations, raising awareness about Badger Care Plus and the marketplace, um, talking about populations we've identified already. Jobless is probably the biggest one that has come up obviously in wake of the pandemic. Uninsured children is another one that we always find particularly concerning, like children that should be on Badger Care more specifically and then immigrant populations. And we want to identify different community agencies and give them the information they need so that these communities are then able to perform the outreach and get, get to people where they live, essentially. With that, we also have, uh, we want to work more with the other work groups. And I think with the vision for this group, there was a, the intention of a lot of collaboration between these. And I think with COVID and everything, we didn't get an opportunity to properly do that last year. And I think that we, we can be really successful at this this year. For example, we identified some of the discussion points we were talking about, probably belong in workforce capacity. So I will now be going to those meetings and working with the other coordinators on how we can also work with data, marketing and promotions. Uh, my work group is particularly interested in what we can get from the data work group because a lot of that information at that county level will help us decide where to spend our efforts and energy where uh, the need is greatest, which is also part of our mission. I think that's basically it. We have other more specific objectives like um, improving discussions with 2-1-1, making sure that they're doing uh, greater referrals and uh, and I think that's it. We have, we went through about probably half of what I think we could accomplish in terms of object, objectives at our last meeting. And I think there's a lot we can discuss in terms of the COVID vaccine and the rollout of that, which is probably where we'll want to spend a bunch of our energy. Great, all right. Well, thank you, Adam. Then I'll go to our last work group and then we'll have uh, questions at the end if anybody has any. So the last work group is marketing. So I believe that's uh, either Kelsey or Stephanie. It's both of us. Um, could you together. allow sharing of screen? Um, let me see if I can or if Derek can. Stephanie should be able to share now. Thank you. So we're gonna do our best to uh, maintain our talk within the five minutes. But I will say that um, promotions did a lot during open enrollment. And so this is our first time meeting since open enrollment. So we'll do our best. <laughs> um, so let me just start with uh, some of our big uh, things that we accomplished for open enrollment. And you know these are things that we worked uh, together within the work groups to build out and help each other accomplish. Some were led by one organization or another, but a lot of feedback and, and whatnot happened within the groups. So that was the WISCOVERED website, that was the OCI toolkit to promote WISCOVERED and open enrollment in general. Um, that was statewide TV and radio ads, statewide billboard and bus messaging, and statewide social media content. And I'll just go through 
Um, Kelsey and I will go through these with the three individual organizations who did the majority of the content creation. Uh, so Covering Wisconsin uh, was in charge of getting the TV and radio ads uh, done. And this was a huge campaign that was purchased through the Wisconsin Broadcasters Association. So these are for public service announcements. It allows us to broadcast uh, around the state um, with like just a, a complete blast of media. Um, and there's a lot more uh, cost effective than paying for individual uh, time with radio or TV stations. So uh, I just got the report from them. Uh, there was a total of 162 radio stations and of those uh, there were 8,893 ads played and of the 36 TV stations, which that broadcast throughout the state, those 36 stations, there was 1,227 ads. And I know that um, Adam, as he was one of the people who did one of the commercials, uh, we had ad, uh, the commercials and radio ads were both in English and Spanish. He got contacted a lot by our partners in the rural parts of the state saying, hey, I saw your ad. So we know that people saw them. Um, and then there was also a lot of billboards in buses. And I will say um, a good portion of what I'm sharing with you uh, uh, was paid for by the CARES Act funding. So we were able to really extend our normal reach. So um, I'm gonna, Milwaukee's in a separate category. So I'm just talking about statewide minus Milwaukee, Racine, Kenosha counties. So um, with the rest of the state, there were 70 billboards. We estimate about 18 million impressions uh, were generated in, in those regions. Um, and predominantly we focused on regions where uh, we did some research about you know, layoffs and, and hardship and, and really tried to focus where we put those billboards. Um, and then a lot of interstates where there's a lot of uh, traffic between counties. Um, and then there was also uh, bus placards in Madison, Janesville, Appleton, Oshkosh, La Crosse and Green Bay. And then the social media campaign, part of this was um, really boosted by the Broadcasters Association. Um, each TV and radio station would post our social media content for the week on their stations, which allowed us to really reach a, a much larger audience. And then we would boost it after, um, you know, a day after that happened. So our overall reach there, and that was statewide, uh, was over 300,000 impressions. Um, we had over 91,000 engagements and we were really pleased with that number. We're also really pleased that, because most of what we boosted and, and shared were videos. Um, so over 87,000 uh, people watched at least 15 seconds of those videos. And then we had over 3,000 link clicks. And when people click on the link, they were sent directly to the WIS covered site. Uh, Twitter, 45 tweets, over 99,000 tweet impressions. And we thought this was really interesting, over 800 uh, profile visits. So when people saw our tweet, they became intrigued and went to see who's, who's sending out this tweet. What's the profile look like? Um, and then just some additional things. There were three Facebook Live events and uh, three earned media opportunities. And then MCAN, um, I don't think I have time to really explain the partnership with MCAN, but they, they were able to contract with um, a, a firm in Milwaukee that really, really does great targeting for um, some of the hard to reach audiences who are the most vulnerable. So um, in addition to some of the other stuff, they, they worked a lot with community influencers um, grassroots outreach. Um, so they, they, they were able to engage a lot of mobilizers on the ground. And then they also were able to um, launch a social and digital media campaign. Um, and they had um, over 800,000 impressions. So we had some really, really good numbers with that campaign. Um, they did some additional radio ads uh, really trying to localize the content. Um, additional print media in the region for local newspapers. And then they also had an outdoor campaign. Um, 
doesn't have the total billboard numbers, but I want to say over 50 billboards in that region. And, um, and the buses, I want to say maybe uh, 30, over 30 bus ads. So uh, a lot of great reach in, in that region and really targeted. And, and that was, their whole campaign was uh, Racine, Kenosha, Milwaukee. And now I'll let Kelsey take it. Great, thanks Steph. All right, so we updated wiscover.com with an open enrollment section and visitors were encouraged to contact a health insurance expert if they needed help applying or renewing a plan. Um, we connected visitors with health, directly with healthcare.gov so they'd be able to update their information or complete their application. Um, we connected them with experts at Covering Wisconsin and uh, also had folks learn more about Medicare open enrollment as well. Um, and then I created a digital media toolkit webpage where People could download press release templates, social media posts and graphics, videos, and other materials. And then folks could also contact us directly through that webpage if they wanted more information or if they wanted customized graphics or anything like that. And the toolkit usage, um, here's just a small sampling. It was used by insurance agencies, health departments, local and tribal government, state agencies, municipalities, and then the legislature as well. Um, and in the bottom right corner, you can see the Job Center of Wisconsin uh, put a nice sliding image on their homepage. So folks that were looking for job opportunities were able to click right on that sliding banner and get connected to wiscover.com. So that was a great partnership as well. And here are some of our earned media opportunities over the past open enrollment season. Um, it was picked up, our press releases were picked up 17 times by third party media, resulting in coverage on TV, radio, and social media platforms. And here's just some of our social media numbers. Our highest performing post was a video with the Lieutenant Governor. It reached 14,581 people and had 15,375 impressions. And on Twitter, uh, we have our sample of the eight and 10, eight out of 10 people qualify for help. That was our highest performing tweet. Then we had 944 impressions on Instagram. And overall, we had 12,272 page views on wiscover.com. Uh, we had statewide visitors, strong Milwaukee presence due to the help from MKEN and covering Wisconsin. We also had a lot of visitors from out of state. So we had over 800 people visit the website just from the Chicago, Chicago land area. Um, Almost 70% of visitors were brought to the website via social media, which is no surprise given the fact that we had such a strong digital media presence with MCAN and covering Wisconsin. 22% of our visitors directly typed the web address into a web browser, so they could have seen it on a billboard or a bus, anything like that. And over 500 visitors navigated to covering Wisconsin's connector tool from wiscover.com. And the website referred 464 visitors to healthcare.gov and 292 visitors to sign up for Badger Care Plus. I can't read that because I <laughs> have my little uh, thing over. Hold on one second. There we go. Wiscover.com also routed over 600 phone calls to 211, the Medigap helpline, and Covering Wisconsin. And then we incorporated some 211 numbers on this slide. So you can compare the open enrollment period from 2020 and 2019. Overall, there were 49,664 total requests this past year versus 26,862 last year. If you just compare the different healthcare related numbers, it's just staggering. Um, very similar health insurance specific related questions though. So all of that can be chalked up to 
people asking about COVID-19. And then here are some of the goals for 2021. We'll be preparing for enrollment periods, <clears throat> whether that's additional open enrollment periods, special enrollment periods. We'll just keep an eye on uh, that. <laughs> and then we'll be supporting COVID-19 vaccine messaging, continuing developing resources for consumers, then working on post-pandemic public health emergency targeted outreach, um, which was mentioned earlier for Badger Care Plus messaging, making sure that everyone's able to enroll in healthcare after, their, after the public health emergency comes to an end. That's all I have. All right, great. Well, thank you both, uh, Kelsey and Stephanie, for that update for marketing. Um, so we can maybe take a couple minutes if people have questions for any of the work groups that presented, but I do wanna say we also have um, a couple discussions we wanna have later about the special enrollment period. And then we are having a conversation about partnership process improvement. So if any of your questions are about connecting across work groups, I think we can have that conversation later in the meeting um, instead. Are there any specific questions for any of the work group reports? Uh, my question is for Kelsey and Stephanie. I just wanna thank you guys. My niece Quintella is in one of your videos and it was extremely popular with our family in Chicago and in Memphis. I think we got everybody registered or signed up for insurance, but that video was an absolute hit with our family. I just want to share that. Thanks. Great. Thanks. All right. Well, I, there aren't any... Go ahead. This is Shannon from the Wisconsin Primary Healthcare Association. And I was wondering, this question is for the the workforce work group, and then also, I guess, DHS more generally, but um, there is the Well Badger Resource Center uh, that got rolled out. And so in some of what Bobby was sharing, I don't know if there's been any conversations when he was talking about, you know, creating that hub for information. Um, I don't, I'm wondering if what is currently out there in the workforce attached to it is that all has that all been thought about or considered as kind of a launching point for that hub um thanks let me get my mic back on here um yeah i mean i'm i'm very familiar with well badger we work with them quite a bit through the children with special health care needs network and um there's uh Quite a bit of referrals within that network that we receive. Um, I would say that it's you know the um, the hub idea is um, is evolving, continuing because as we we learn of additional resources and training opportunities and other um, mechanisms out there. Um, I, I well Badger I think is listed in our resources matrix as one of the of uh, the spots and I think to, to be taking into consideration sort of like 211 as well. Um, but I think at least within the work group, there was there was a, a, a thinking that there should be some more specific focused opportunities for assistance. And then that type of assistance is gonna be driven by um, more specialized training in our specific areas. I think it's also gonna be important to, uh, you know, to, to try and connect the dots of some of the other resources that are out there. That's a bit of what 2 on one is doing and what um, Well Badger is doing as well. But I think the focus is more, at least in my mind, at least thinking about what are the questions that you can ask to frame up what the issues are for the person. And some of those are are very well known in terms of, you know, what age are they? What's, what income level are they? Are they immigrants? Uh, are they veterans? Um, what's their family size? We have an idea of what the federal poverty limit is for that family is an estimate. And once you provide that sort of framing, then you uh, have an opportunity to think about some of the next steps to take for referral because you know their age or they have a disability or they're a veteran and how, how those, those processes might work. I think that some of those um, complementary sort of like intake and referral opportunities could also be extended to work with 
well badger or 211 if they were were interested because um that might be helpful for them to be better trained on the very front end and then the hub can handle more of the assister type questions or complex case resolution issues um this is donna i actually have a follow-up to that um one is um, the resource matrix. Can that be made available to the group more broadly? We've been trying. It's a it's a really clunky. I was just working on it this morning, um, and it's a it's a multi tabbed spreadsheet um, in Excel, and it doesn't travel very well. But um, and it's just in terms of maintaining version control. Um, but I think we have a mechanism to do that. But um, standby i think we'll be able to, to do a sort of a read-only version that's locked but we just don't want it to get corrupted and, and changed and and so there's a lot of information in there but i think we can that'd be very helpful thank you um and i wanted to know um based on the stephanie's presentation and all that amazing marketing that went on in very short term round i want to note based on i i think the release of the cares funding and like October, needing to get up to speed for open enrollment. Um, that and and I could be wrong about this, but my understanding is, um, you know, we had this uh, such fantastic outreach and marketing and really getting a message out. But people may know that the early numbers that came out for the ACA uh, marketplace enrollment for our state did show, you know, an overall we didn't. Um, statewide meet the level of enrollment or I should say marketplace plan selections um, that we had that the state had attained a year ago and and you know still trying to understand I mean we need to see more numbers and more detail which will be released in April from CMS or um, the, uh, from from the federal agency but right now still trying to understand you know what went on but I also understand from talking to Allison and others that while the statewide enrollment numbers were down the the enrollment numbers for the for the um, trained assisters the navigators and CACs their volume was up um, and their actual enrollments were up quite substantially I, I so, actually um, I want to jump in and challenge that just a little bit Covering okay. Wisconsin's numbers were up and some of our partners were up, but there were many agencies that because of the different way they serve the community had trouble getting to the people and had low numbers. Okay, so all right, so thank you, Adam. So my understanding, again, covering Wisconsin navigators had high up had volume that had increased substantially. And I think the, the, the those who are under contract with covering Wisconsin had increased volume, maybe others did not have increased volume. So I think there, there's two sides of this I mean, there's multiple sides, but two important pieces of this equation are one getting out the word and the other is getting people actually connected to whatever kind of enrollment assistance they that they need. Um, and um, making sure that that as Bobby's working on Bobby and his and his group, um, making sure that that workforce is out there exists and knows how to reach into the community and put themselves out there where the people are not wait for the people to come to them that kind of thing. And so I just want to point that out because like I said, I'm, I'm super excited that the navigators and the those under under the navigator contracts had had higher volume this year than previous years. We're going to need to get more workforce out there and, and serving more people if we're going to get overall enrollment up in the state. Um, and also, I mean, I think this plan, I, I'm, I'm going to be interested in seeing more about this hub idea. I, I'm, something I'm really interested in is, you know, we have such a resource rich state with so much that's been built out over the last now eight years um, of working in, on marketplace assistance, as well as the last many decades of Bobby and, and other, you know, ADRCs and all the other agencies working in the Medicaid space that I want to, that I'm very interested in not building something entirely new, a whole new infrastructure, but building on the assets that already exist. Um, and in some place, in, in my view, we do actually already have something that is a hub. We just need to better organize ourselves. Um, so I'll leave it at there. Great. Thank you for those um, comments and, and questions, Donna. I think um, some good things to think about with these 
work groups as we move forward and possible coordination across across some of these work groups as well. Um, and a good tie in to our next conversation, which is about um, as possibilities for um, a special enrollment period um, and what you know, kind of preparations we might want to consider or ways this group might want to prepare for if there is an announcement about a special enrollment period before open enrollment later this year. So to start that off, I'm hoping that Allison can maybe give us a kind of overview and recap of the previous conversations this group has had um, and, and really what we're discussing in this, um, in this space about special enrollment periods. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. And actually, um... Derek, since I might want to share my screen as well, I'm not sure if I have that permission, but if you're able to give it to me, that would be great. Um, so permission. just, thank you. Um, so just a quick uh, summary of the special, potential special enrollment period. And then I want to also tie in just uh, as Sarah mentioned, what happened with uh, CARES Act funding and what we can learn from that going forward. Um, so, um, some of you may have already been hearing um, that with the new federal administration, there is a um, strong possibility of what they're terming right now a special enrollment period. Um, so we expect to learn as soon as this Thursday, which is January 28th, I think that's when the administration is intending to release their executive orders around health care and health coverage. Um, so we're hoping that we, we know as soon as possible um, anything that we can learn around that. But um, right now we don't um, know what form it's gonna take. Again, I'm assuming that it will happen. Um, and so this is going to be something in advance or the intention or the understanding is that it's gonna be something in advance of the next open enrollment period, which typically happens in the fall. Um, a little bit about terminology. So if it is in fact a special enrollment period, typically special enrollment periods are really just for a, um, as, uh, consumers with certain that fit certain criteria. And so um, uh, it, I, I think I want us to be open to um, the distinction that may occur um, in that in fact, it is it an actual opening back up of the, of the marketplace. And in fact, more of a, an emergency open enrollment period, uh, which would be very different uh, and in some ways a lot easier <laughs> and simpler than if it's a special enrollment period. We have special enrollment periods. Uh, navigators assist with special enrollment periods throughout the year. Uh, this is for consumers who are experiencing um, uh, life changes. And so we need to help them transition from one coverage option to another. And in fact, there is a FEMA special enrollment period that's happening right now. It's been happening and it dates back to the beginning of last year. So if consumers have lost coverage um, at any point over since January uh, 1st of 2020, they are actually eligible to uh, seek coverage in the marketplace. And again, navigators have been helping consumers with this as much as possible and, and trying to uh, really uh, broaden uh, the number of consumers that can get coverage right now. So uh, more to be seen uh, about what form this takes, uh, takes shape of in the coming days. Um, but really the critical thing is what can we as a partnership do to prepare? Um, we don't know what the timeline is gonna look like. Uh, we don't know how long. And again, we don't know quite the form, but there's so much we can learn from um, our recent experience, uh, especially this past open enrollment period uh, and with the CARES Act funding. And I wanna just take a moment to share a little bit more. I know Stephanie um, shared for the marketing and promotions group, some of the marketing and promotions that happened. I'm not gonna go through that again. Um, it, we have it here. You saw you know, billboards and TV and buses and all that really awesome stuff. Um, what I wanna, Point two is the CARES Act funding also, um, so as was mentioned, it was announced early October. Um, uh, funding was um, shared with Covering Wisconsin and was then deployed around the state uh, for a wide variety of things. Obviously, the promotions and marketing, um, you know, is in the bucket of raising awareness. Um, there's been such a dearth of, of funding and support for promotions and marketing over the past several years and really just trying to 
build back that awareness and understanding of what is available. Um, the outreach is also part of that. And I'll talk about that in just a second, but I wanted to mention, obviously, uh, a lot of these funds were supporting enrollment assisters, uh, increasing and leveraging, uh, for the most part, enrollment assistance and experience, expertise that exists in the state, but isn't supported. And so uh, a lot of folks who may have previously served as CACs or even navigators, uh, or maybe do that as part of many other functions in their work. And so we were able to provide funding um, to increase the FTE available to consumers in the state. Um, and uh, navigators serve statewide. We do that all year, but other CACs were able to focus on more local areas uh, including all these folks in the connector tool, making it a lot easier for consumers and other professionals to find them um, and to connect with them. So you see here the total, total number of enrollment assisters, nearly 18 FTE um, statewide coverage, but again with those pockets of really focused assistance and knowing that local area, uh, a total of 10 agencies that were supporting that. Um, and then just on those alone, uh, the number of enrollments completed um, uh, over 1,800. 18, um, one thing I'll also mention in relation to enrollment assistance that actually relates a little bit to the hub idea. So we've been working with 211 over the past several years to help 211 be aware of what are the resources in the state and how can they connect people when consumers call. We uh, provided some funding to 211 so that when consumers called, they were then able to provide a warm transfer. So typically they just give a phone number and say, okay, here's a number you can call. We know that's a lot of consumers drop off at that point. So they two and one with this funding was able to then directly connect the consumer to an agency in the state. Um, similarly, if it happened late at night over the weekends and a lot of agencies are closed, um, they were able to offer the consumer an opportunity for a callback. So, Another uh, related thing to enrollment assistance is trying to really connect people to cover our assistance that's available. But then I wanted to dive into a little bit more about the outreach and inreach um, that's listed here. And this is the crucial part that, um, again, I think has just been undervalued and we, we as a state can support uh, more. It's already happening with this partnership um, and it definitely happened with the CARES Act funding. So we provided a total of 26 agencies uh, with funds uh, and a range of funds to really connect with the, the community that they serve. Um, you know, so covering Wisconsin as a navigator, you know, part of our role is to do outreach and we do it all year round. That said, there's a ton of outreach that needs to happen. There's a ton of communities that uh, really need to be connected. And um, especially those communities that are most at risk of lacking coverage, of churning on and off um, of not trusting the system. And being connected with a community agency that they trust, that they know, and this community agency is sharing out information. So that's exactly what happened. Um, we were very quickly able to provide small grants to uh, many different agencies to um, share out information that we created and as part of the, the partnership, uh, many of these same promotions turning them into outreach materials, turning them into just a quick email message, text message, phone message, even at times. Um, and so you see some of the numbers here and I won't go through them in depth, but um, it's, so, it's so critical. What we know is that word of mouth is the most commonly cited way that people say they have heard about coverage options and assistance. And we know that's hard to do. <laughs> how, do you, how do you get that word of mouth happening? Um, you know, the promotion is extremely important, but it's the word of mouth that actually gets people and that resonates the most. And so that's where these mobilizer organizations, that were, that's where the outreach and inreach comes into play. Um, if they're hearing it from that agency that they trust, that might be the one that gets them in the door. So, uh, <laughs> With all that, um, and I, I'm sure I could go on and on about that, um, my main message with this is recognizing that, um, you know, we have a lot to build on. We have a lot of things that we've already done. We have uh, agencies and communities and materials 
that we have developed, I think that they're, uh, in terms of preparation, we're about halfway there. Um, but for this, this group to you know, leverage our, our expertise and thinking um, and insight about what more can we do to be prepared for this upcoming opportunity of either a special enrollment period or an emergency open enrollment period. Um, we don't know if there will be additional funds at a federal level for this. Um, I know that that's on, you know, um, something being encouraged, but at this time, um, that's not anything that I'm aware of. Um, so I will, yeah, I will leave it at that. Great. Thank you, Allison, for that background. That's um, really helpful. So uh, then I want to be able, I want to just open it up for a discussion um, for a few minutes then here about what um, folks are thinking when they hear, you know, how uh, how open enrollment went before and knowing that we aren't really sure whether we will see a special enrollment period or an open enrollment period or what that's gonna look like. Um, but just wanted to open that up for people to share yeah. their thoughts or their questions that we should consider. Yeah, can I uh, add just a little bit? Um, one thing about the numbers yeah. um, from this year goes hand in hand with the COVID emergency and people remaining on Badger Care and Medicaid. So the margin that we dropped, I think is fully covered and more by that number of people who stayed on public benefits. So that's just one observation to take into consideration when thinking about how effective our different strategies were. Uh, the other thing is just to note, the special enrollment period that covers virtually everybody is essentially um, an indefinite open enrollment period and should be treated as such, I believe, because um, people don't know what special enrollment period means, and it does not matter to them. They just want to know that they can get insurance. That's all I've got. I do think that's that's a helpful point on understanding where the numbers are um, and, and the impact that we've seen um, for people experiencing unemployment and going on other, other coverages. Uh, so there are other people that have uh, comments or ideas on how we can prepare for whatever we might we might be getting at the federal level. Um, I'll just add, Adam, that I'm already thinking on the the piece that you mentioned about how do you communicate the fact that you can now sign up for health insurance again, you know? I don't think open enrollment resonates with a large percentage of the population and yeah. most have no idea what a special enrollment period is. Yeah, so, yeah I'm, uh, and I, I think it's helpful for all of us to consider that when we think about communicating a lot of these ideas, like what, what's gonna make sense to people? Yeah, so I think that's a really interesting point. You know, obviously you're thinking about this stuff all the time, but I hadn't considered the idea that open enrollment would be an effective messaging, but it very well may be. <laughs> This is Bobby. I was just going to say that one of the things, you know, I think we've got, you know, we've got a, a demonstrated, you know, strong collaboration through this last open enrollment opportunities to continue to grow and expand it and build upon what we've learned, thinking about how do we, you know, build on that capacity, work with the, the, the additional capacity that exists around the state that we, that may be somewhat untapped. Um, and I think, you know, learning more about how we work within communities both at the you know the mobilizer and the influencer level of those of those communities and and that will help propel that word of mouth issue I think a, a bit more but tapping into some of those key resources uh, in communities not just you know organizations but some of the, the key folks and the key leaders that are you know that are helping to influence uh, communities and, and attitudes and behaviors. Right. You know, if I could share real quick, the week of February 14th through the 20th, the Wisconsin Legislative Black Caucus is, is hosting a really fun week of events. Um, we're going to be doing a presentation on the 19th, and it's going to be a virtual mental health outreach to the community. Um, what I would encourage is... Um, 
if you could get your information to the various events and have it scrolling right under their presentations, um, that has been very effective for us. And so we just find, if I find an event that, that I like and it's consistent with our message, we just reach out to them and say, hey, can we stroll our information, resource information at the bottom of the screen while your event is going on? And so people have been very receptive to that. That's awesome. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, that's a great idea. Yeah, no, exactly. I mean, those kinds of things are um, that level of information sharing, Aaron, is exactly the kinds of things that I know you guys have been really active with um, over the years, both as a partner with Covering Wisconsin, but just in this space in, in general and with this partnership and uh, with some of the mobilizers that were worked with this past open enrollment, it was similar, kind of a similar level of engagement that only I think community agencies um, know and have access to. And, you know, I mean, just providing, you know, it's, I, I think what was so um, wonderful is being able to say here, you know, we can provide some, a small amount of funding, please go forth and share this message in whatever way makes sense to you. Um, not overthinking it on our end and really just knowing that, you know, this is something that uh, can be shared. I think, you know, if, if that opportunity is available again at a state level, uh, again, because I don't know if there's any federal funding that's going to be in support of the special enrollment period, um, that would be fantastic. Um, obviously, in addition to other things, but um, that, that ground level of sharing of information. Um, so in terms of what Adam, you said about um, some agencies maybe didn't have the capacity. Um, I, I know that in my own interactions with some partner agencies, I had one that couldn't take us up on the, um, the grant funds because uh, more than half of their staff uh, got sent home because of COVID, because um, they were exposed and it was right, you know, right at the beginning of open enrollment. Um, and there were just various challenges that happened that really reduced um, enrollment assister capacity. And so a part of me wonders if um, maybe something this group could think about is ways we can reach out to these agencies who did have some, some problems and low numbers and find out, you know, what do they need? Do they need some type of training in order to do online um, telephone assistance, um, do, uh, we need to help them uh, integrate like an online scheduling tool because um, one of the things we've heard, I think from two and one is that, you know, if, or, or other people, if you're scheduling online and you go into the connector tool and five agencies, you have to call them to schedule an appointment, but the top two, you can just click and, and make an online appointment. So maybe that's, that's a barrier. Just really kind of try to think about, um, what's happening to discourage uh, the calling of, for those agencies or not um, able them to, to really help the community. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll keep this brief because I know we got to move on. Um, I think it was the in-person assistance locations that were hit the hardest, um, but also or these groups that, you know, we think about enrollment 24 seven, the ones that provide other services maybe do not. And yes, sharing a model that works with them would be probably very effective and appreciated. Great. All right. Well, I know there's probably a lot more to, to discuss on there, but I think that's a good um, to keep that on everybody's radar. And um, I think ties a little bit into the conversation we wanted to have around the partnership process improvement in general um, and some better kind of collaboration and coordination across these work groups towards some of these goals. So um, I'm also again going to just, um, I'll skip my brief overview because we're running a little short on time and just um, jump into Melissa and Allison um, for their um, kind of recommended updates that they have put together around the possible improvement opportunities for this partnership. Thanks, Sarah. I'll kick us off and then Allison will make everything understandable. Um, so I don't want to take for granted that everyone listening is aware that those of us that gave the work group reports um, earlier in this session are the coordinators of the work group. 
and we work in partnership with state agency staff within each of the work groups. This partnership is truly a public private partnership and it's been uh, working great. But as 2020 came to a close, Bobby, Adam, Stephanie, and Allison and I decided it would be a good idea to do a year in review and think about what we could be doing better at the work group level or the council level. And we recognize that the past year went a little differently than what we had originally imagined. A huge part of that, of course, is COVID, which has created extra work for all of us, but especially DHS staff. And now that we're seeing some light on the horizon, we think it's a good time for a reset. So we decided to put together a list of recommendations and met with OCI and DHS leadership to share these ideas. And so one recommendation is that we're hoping to identify two central points of contact, one at DHS and one at OCI, to help us coordinate our work between the work groups. Um, and I just want to say we share the commissioner's enthusiasm for Sarah's hire because I believe she'll be taking this on for OCI, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and then as we get farther along down the you know, getting rid of COVID, knock on wood, we expect DHS will also identify a counterpart and that's going to help us reopen channels with leadership and gain feedback and buy in for the initiatives we're working on earlier in the process. Um, you know, we all have to recognize this partnership is a volunteer effort. We all have um, regular jobs to worry about too. And what this is about is really making sure that we're using our resources wisely, both our private resources and the state's resources, and that we remain focused on the council's core goals and objectives. Um, so that's really kind of the at the work group level, but we also share a strong interest in improving communication channels at the council level too. So if we're honest, the four work groups has been where all the action has been over the past year. So I just wanna put a pitch in and encourage those of you with the energy and enthusiasm and time to consider joining a work group. But outside the work groups, we also have a strong interest in building channels for feedback and input at the council level, um, particularly around you know, agreeing on core goals and objectives. And I'll hand it off to Allison, but before I give up the mic, I just wanna point out that despite the challenges of 2020, the partnership was wildly successful in so many areas. And I'm just really grateful and honored to be part of this work. And I thank the governor, DHS and OCI for continuing to support what we believe in. I, I totally agree with that, Melissa. And I'll just say, I think in terms of this group, especially, um, you know, one of the desires is given just that COVID continues given to, you know, knowing that we're all uh, continue to be very busy and drawn in many other ways. Um, as Melissa said, the idea is that the work group leads and the liaisons with the with OCI and DHS will meet on a monthly basis to kind of dig into some of the process improvement issues as well as just um, how do we move from ideas and action to further implementation or buy-in at a state level. I think for this group, um, and as uh, Melissa mentioned, one question that um, uh, would be really helpful to consider is, you know, what is the, the longer term role in the context of the work that the work groups are doing? How does the Partnership Advisory Council uh, feed into that and respond to that? And the, the monthly meetings of the work group coordinators and the DHS and OCI liaisons will help to think about that. But I do think that it needs um, input from an advisory council members. Um, because this has been a, it's been a new year um, over this past year and it was, it was torn asunder by COVID. Um, but uh, I think if we could take a few minutes for feedback from this group um, as we start to, Hit, to dig may into. May I begin? Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm really antsy, sorry. Um, one thing, <laughs> it's just an objective observation that I wanna put out there and I don't think it requires discussion is that um, we flip the agenda on these, on these particular meetings. If the meat of what we wanna talk and what we wanna discuss in terms of accomplishments is the most important thing we do in the entire meeting, we should move that up the agenda reports from work groups are awesome. We're doing a ton, but honestly, there's nothing actionable 
necessarily coming out of those discussions. And if there is, it can go somewhere else on the agenda. So I just think we could use this time better. Um, second, my work group will kick me if I don't say this. One thing we need um, or want is leadership. So communication between leadership, not between the necessarily the groups here, but between other agencies. We're having a hard time doing outreach to like DPI, DS, DCF, um, we, we, Derek is doing a great job with DWD and I think there's, but there's more that could be done there. Um, but really it would be great if we were having um, the leadership in terms of the secretary to secretary level or high level official to high level official level, talk about this group and how important this work is. And so we can combine efforts about what's most important. Adam, this is Mark. Uh, you know, I, I hear what you're saying, and I think that is important, and that's something that maybe uh, I can help out with, and I'm sure the new DHS uh, Secretary, uh, Kimberly, uh, will be interested in doing the same. I'm obviously, she, her plate's a little full right now, but but I can I, I think that's something that we can do to help uh, reach out and and we can even start tonight. I've got, we've got a cabinet call tonight. And, awesome. <laughs> and, 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 and one of the things I was going to talk about was uh, this advisory council meeting today, but uh, we're always, it, it's a good group that likes to collaborate and wants to work together. So uh, we can start that conversation and see where it goes. How, do, how does that sound? That sounds fantastic. I appreciate this uh, so much. Well, well, I look forward to hearing how, how it goes um, at that level, at that meeting and at the level in general. That'd be great. Yeah, Sarah, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll work on that. Absolutely. You know, one thing I, I wish I would have mentioned in our last discussion, but that is kind of related to what Adam said is, um, you know, what we found during the last open enrollment period is how critical the involvement of um, just government leadership is in reaching to the people that we can't normally reach. Um, when, you know, the commissioner is involved or the governor is involved or the lieutenant governor is involved, we get a much broader audience about those messages. And so um, just wanted to mention that to you, Mark, to say, you know, if you're having this cabinet meeting and we end up with another in, uh, you know, open enrollment or special enrollment, which will be an open enrollment period, um, you know, that that involvement was just so important to us. And I think it, it went a long way in getting more people enrolled. Yeah, we, we know that uh, having uh, the lieutenant governor and almost anything boosts the uh, the uh, uh, the uh, response. Uh, and so that that's a great thing, and 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 I think that's something we can definitely work on. Great. Are there other thoughts on um, some of the suggestions Melissa mentioned that we are? Uh, working on implementing or other ideas on coordination across work groups or up to the advisory council level? I, uh, also, oh, go ahead, Allison. I was just going to mention also in reference, so Melissa had mentioned this as part of the data work group that these key performance indicators um, that we've been working on is part of actually um, trying to put together a larger logic, logic model. Um, and basically it's just a frame of reference of trying to say, let's capture the stuff that we're doing here on the partnership, what we're putting in, what's coming in from other sources, maybe outside of the partnership. And then what are the things that we seek to produce uh, and the outcomes we hope to achieve? And I think that'll also really help. And that's something that a future uh, advisory council we're happy to share. Um, it's it's um, there's a really good draft right now, and I think it's it's close to something that could be um, shared. But I think it's also something that'll help to really inform just this idea of um, yeah capturing capturing all the uh, the impact of what we're doing. And that might be a really good place to start our next council meeting in, yeah. in my mind getting to what Adam was talking about is really kicking off with with more of uh, you know the meat um, of the things that we should be looking at as a council that would be great yeah and I would um, just encourage other people on this meeting too um, 
if you're feeling reticent at all, um, but you think you have a good idea, please speak up. Um, nobody bites as far as I know, and we would really love to hear from you and have more participation. <laughs> You know, one of the things that is important for all of us, I think, is just the identification of the, the resources to make some of these things happen. And so well, I was interested, Mark, to hear that OSA is, is submitting a grant. And I'm wondering if it's possible to um, share the goals or object, the relevant to this work group or an abstract of some sort so we can get a, just an idea of what, what you're thinking about, at least, uh, because I think that will help us think about opportunities or maybe other funding and financing opportunities that we should be looking into. Sure, I think we can do that, Sarah. We can uh, uh, share the, uh, the the grant application or maybe not the grant application, yeah. but some, yeah. some of the high level um, um, uh, thoughts that we have on that. Yeah, yep, we yeah. can certainly. Just the, the abstract, down. abstract and goals and objectives would be fine. And I think would give us a good sense of what you're thinking of. You know, separate from from funds, um, I, I just want to note that both agencies, OCI and DHFS, have um, incredible data assets within their inside their agencies. And and OCI, you have been very generous in that we had your staff person who retired recently, um, Joe. Um, her last name is escaping me at the moment. Somebody help me. Joe Ledoux. 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 Yeah. 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 Um, that was helping us put together things with Tableau and, um, and, and thinking about how to draw on existing data assets to, um, you know, tell the, you know, tell the story that, that is needed for, you know, for tracking the KPIs and helping people effectively, you know, create a strategy here. And of course, DHS also has, you know, a, a very broad and deep um, range of data assets. And the problem is not the problem, you know, among other problems COVID presents is how busy they are and those data assets are deployed in many other ways. But I am really interested in figuring out how we can get some way of um, deploying those data assets in a, you know, in a way that, that um, can be put to use for this effort in an organized way. And that I think does require whoever the people are in each of your agencies who are the gurus on those data to be actively engaged in this process. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I agree. I think that is something that we need to do and, and, uh, and we can work with DHS on that. It might not happen as, as you know, Donna, yeah. right away, given where we're at, uh, we're all a little bit shorthanded right I now. Know. And with, with Joe leaving our mm -hmm. shop, uh, uh, that's going to be a, um, an area of expertise we're, we're looking for right now. So, yeah. uh, but, but definitely a valid point and something we, we need to explore. Yeah, thank you. And honestly, I just want to thank you for all the commitment you at OCI have given to this effort and your staffing overall. So thank you. I think Appreciate there are a lot it. of people that would second that. Thank you very much. It's, that's our team. Sarah, Kelsey, Derek, they've done some great work and, and they are committed. They, they, they enjoy mm -hmm. this work and, and we're going to we're going to stay uh, uh, committed to it. And, and I think one of the things that I'm hearing right now is that we should really look at restructuring how these meetings move forward. And, and that we're, we're, it almost sounds like we're talking that we have our tactics for what we're trying to accomplish right now, but we may need to step back and do a little more uh, goal and, 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 and strategy work about what we want, where we want this partnership to, uh, to move to. Um, if that's true, maybe we can, uh, Sarah, we can put together uh, an agenda. Maybe we should be breaking up the meetings a little bit and have a strategy session with the, with the council and then, and then also talk about the, the operational pieces of it. I don't know. I'm, that's just kind of what I'm hearing right now. If, if I'm missing it, let please let me know. I no, that's, think that, that's what I'm hearing too. And that's what I'm saying. Um, but yeah. Allison summed up that point really well. <laughs> yeah. And, and I would say that um, that particular piece of goal setting was just starting to happen when the group started to form and then boom, COVID crisis, total reshift and, and 
then you're in a whole new area and looking back at old goals, things, like they're maybe not as appropriate since we're still in the middle of the crisis. So I would agree with that 100%. Yeah, and I um, I just want to jump in here too and note the note the time that it is three thirty. But I think that's that's a perfect point, Mark, because I was going to say our last agenda item would be to reset um, for the next set the next council meeting, um, and I think it's probably worth before we decide at this larger group exactly when and how we're going to do the next council meeting. Maybe have a little bit of that breakout strategizing conversation to make sure that when we set the next advisory council meeting, we have a good sense of what the goals are and what kind of decisions and things will be moving forward at that meeting, so. That Does that sound sense? good to everybody? Sounds excellent. Yeah, definitely. Sounds great. 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 Well, boy, well then. That, that went by real quickly. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> I'll, I'll let uh, Sarah do the, the finish. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I was just going to say that I think that wraps up our final discussion point, and I will just be, I think, following up with the other um, uh, folks at the advisory council level with an, an email and we can maybe talk about when we want to set up a strategizing kind of conversation before we set the date of the next advisory council meeting. So Excellent. great. Thank you, Sarah, so much. And thank you, everybody. Yeah, yeah of course. Thanks, thank you all. Thanks, everyone. Thank you all. Bye -bye. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. All right. Take care. Bye.